Tonight on Free Minds TV, we'll be discussing immigration, Occupy Wall Street. We'll also be getting into economic tightening in China, plus a whole lot more coming up here on Free Minds TV. Welcome everybody to a brand new edition of Free Minds TV where we the, uh, we challenge you, the viewers, to think outside the box. With you as always is Toby. And Nick. It's episode 225 or season 6, episode 37 of Free Minds TV. And we have a lot to get into. I do want to continue to anger some of the people we angered last week. I, I, <laughs> I think we, we might have lost a few viewers last week, but just in case they're still watching because they're, they're angry, I want to... Fuel that oh, anger. No, it's not like we're going to get canceled, right? No. I mean, we I pretty mean, much get to say what we want because... That's the beauty of It's not access. a for-profit show. We just can... We can do outrageous things yes. and nobody can watch. No but. corporate sponsors to please, just viewers to anger. So I want to continue well, going down that it, line. It, people, people who, who really don't contribute anything to the conversation and just do the, like, the nasty YouTube uh, comments. Mm -hmm. or I don't really mind if I, if, if I, if I annoy you... You're just a troll. Like if you're not, if you're just gonna yell things at me, then no, I think it's great. I, it kind of amuses me. It's really. the whole point of the show. You know what? My view on things changes all the time. I mean, we've been doing this show for about five, six years now. Um, views have changed on on certain subjects, and the the whole object of this show is to challenge people to think outside the box. You know, think about things differently. So if we're angering you. That means we're doing our job. We're, we're challenging your, your prefrontal cortex up in your brain, and I, I like that. So the, the angrier the viewers get, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, keep the angry emails coming. Keep calling us communists or statists or what have you. And despite yeah, see, we get it from all sides. So I know. I mean, we're, we're a fringe of the fringe, yet we're still communists and statists. See? Can't you see the fist? means we're communists, right? Anyways. We thought I, just kind of look cool, oh, yeah. to be honest with you picked it. <laughs> well, actually, we didn't pick it. Someone who I think, yeah, many years ago, former producer picked it. Former so. producer um, kind of ripped it off, morphed it into It's a common symbol. So. Anyways, let's get into the content, Nick. It's time to anger some people. Let's talk about immigration. That's a subject that, you know, even the small government folks, they're for big government when it comes to immigration, right? Because they took our jobs. They're evil people who we should close the borders and send them back to Mexico. Uh, right? Well, that's what some states are trying to do. And even those small government Republicans out there, the ones who are really for a fiscal responsibility, getting the government out of their your life, well, except when it comes to illegal immigration. See, everybody's got their pet issue. And, well, there's a whole lot of angry people out there who need a scapegoat, and immigrants have become a major bullseye for scapegoats, especially in these tough economic times where jobs are tough to have, right? In Alabama, for example, there's a story we were talking about last week about how kids aren't going to school anymore, immigrant children aren't going to school anymore, or many of them are not going to school because they're afraid of, well, being deported, being arrested, detained indefinitely, or their parents are afraid of that, so they're keeping their kids home from school. And we, we discussed that. Some people said, well, it's not we went on to discuss the fact that, in my belief, if you don't send people to school, you're going to get more crime out there on the streets. But uh, some of our viewers think differently. They believe that education is just government indoctrination. And to a certain extent, yes, it is. It's indoctrination, definitely is. But private education is pretty much the same as public education. But it's still important to help people get along in this very complex society. That's where I'm coming from. I think education is vitally important. and. Just to throw it out the window. It's well, not to mention a lot, of the, a lot of those children are actually U.S. citizens. Just their parents may not be documented, but if they were born here, then they're U.S. citizens. Anchor babies, Nick. Anchor babies. Well, you can call it what you want, but basically, if you're born, the rules as they apply, or if you're born in the United States, it doesn't matter who your who your parents were or where they came from. You're a U.S. citizen. That's been the you know that's been one of the judges of citizenship for as long as there's been the United States. So. Basically, what you're doing is you're seeing U.S. citizens who were born here or were born, you know, people, some of these children might have been born in Mexico, but if they came over when they were one or two years old, they've, they may have lived 10 or 12 years here in the U.S. as Americans and be, you know, they might be better at explaining American history and things like that than your kid. 
Yeah, well, thought. In, in my opinion, I, I, I don't know what it, it makes them less American. I don't really care what your immigration status is personally. I mean, does it really matter you were born on this plot of soil or this plot of soil and an imaginary border separates the two? So one person's legal, one person's illegal. It's very arbitrary and silly if you ask me. But anyways, I've got a new story to talk about. Uh, people were angry about the education aspect. So let's see if people are angry about the working aspect because that's what it's all about, right? Jobs. Immigration wouldn't matter if it wasn't for uh, unemployment. If there were plenty of jobs out there for everyone, we wouldn't care about the people coming up from Mexico or, well, I guess we don't care about the ones from Canada. We wouldn't care about the people coming from Mexico and other um, poor parts of the world to work because we'd all be rich and having jobs, right? So it's the jobs that matter, right? Not so much. In Alabama, where this new immigration, really strict immigration law, has recently gone into effect, the jobs, well, people aren't doing them. And the immigrants who used to do them, well, they're not showing up to work because they don't want to be detained indefinitely or deported. A sponsor of the Alabama's tough new immigration law told desperate tomato farmers Monday that he won't change the law even though they told him that their crops are rotting in the field and they are at risk of losing their farms. They complained that the new law, which went into effect Thursday, scared off many of the migrant workers at harvest time. The tomatoes are rotting on the vine, and there's very little we can do, said Chad Smith, who farms tomatoes with his uncle, father, and two brothers. Um, it looks like the law allows police to, as I mentioned, detain um, immigrants indefinitely or deport them. Uh, the farmers said that some of their workers may um, have been in the country illegally, but they were the only ones willing to do the work. Yes, all those unemployed people, 9.9% .9 of them, well, they just don't want to pick tomatoes at the low price um, that the immigrants were willing to. You know, the break-even price for the farmers to keep their farms. Uh, they, won't, um, they won't be growing next season, said farmer Wayne Smith. They're going to lose everything. Does America know how much this is going to affect them? They'll find out when they have to go to the grocery store and buy their uh, tomatoes or any tomato-based uh, products. Chad Smith and his family normally would have 12 trucks working in the fields on Monday, but only had three of them operational. He estimates that his family could lose up to $150,000 this season because of the lack of help to pick up the crop. We, we will be lucky to be in net business next year, he said. And it looks like there's a lot of farmers feeling this pitch. When they went to uh, Senator Beeson, who was one of the sponsors of, the, of this bill, and asked him if they, he'd be willing to come and help pick some tomatoes, he declined the request. Um, and no surprise to me. Well, uh, the, the, it's interesting to note here that at one point in the U.S., immigrant labor wasn't used on farms. Um, but really because, because of all the regulations that are out there um, and the rather unreasonable standard of liability that exists, you can't have, largely it used to be young people, school children, um, and you know, people looking who were out of work or looking for supplemental income who would do it, you can't do that anymore. But you used to really, if there was a farming community, you used to actually get the labor from the local area. You can't do that anymore. It just doesn't work because Americans are not willing to do the work. There's entitlement system issues that come into this because frankly, you can make more on unemployment than you can going to work in agriculture in many parts of the country. You've got the liability issues and the regulations, so it's not like you can just have all the school kids pick, you know, pick the crops. Frankly, that's why a lot of school vacations exist during the times of year when they do. It actually coincides with planting times and harvest times in a lot of the country. I grew up on a farm so. and I would pick the crops on our on the family farm, but then again it wasn't a, a big farm like the, the farms are today. Um, farms definitely have changed over the years and as you mentioned, yes, immigrant workers are mainly the people who, who pick those tomatoes and all the other produce you get at the right. grocery but store unless gonna, it's shipped from another country. You're really not going to, um, barring a major shift away from the amount of government involvement you have in the labor market today, uh, you just can't employ Americans to do that work. Unless people are going to be paying five times more at the grocery right. store to fill up the cart. If you want, well, I don't know if it'd be five times more, but it would be it would be a significant amount of money. Yeah, I have no idea. I, and the, it's just the claim, the claim out there that is just so silly that the reason Americans don't have jobs is because immigrants are taking them. It's false because the jobs are there. But as you mentioned, Nick, 
You make more collecting unemployment on your couch than you do going and picking tomatoes in a hot field. That's yeah. why the tomatoes are rotting on the vine right now. Right. And I mean, th frankly, when you're talking about the loss of jobs, there's a lot of factors that go into that. It's n I don't think it's Mexicans and Guatemalans coming up that have killed. They certainly are not the people who have killed good paying jobs or the, the factor that has killed good paying jobs in the United States. Frankly, a lot of the jobs that you, you used to be able to work at for a livable wage, they're going to other parts of the world. We live in a world that where basically you can do things like engineering, any kind of information-based work from anywhere in the world. And if somebody in India or China is willing to do it for $10,000 a year instead of $50,000 a year, then guess what? Most companies are going to offshore that part of their operations. We've seen it happen with manufacturing. We're seeing it happening you know, with you know, design and engineering, the things we were supposed to do after the manufacturing left. Really, you're, you're dealing with a lot of issues there. Not to mention automation, where we're supposed to just start smashing machines. They destroy a lot of jobs. Robots do a lot of the jobs that people used to do. There'd be a lot more jobs assembling cars and widgets and factories if complicated machines weren't doing it. Should we just smash the machines, take a step back a few decades, and just put people to work in factories doing jobs that, you know, for, for a lot more money than it would take to run a machine to do it? There are a lot of factors that go into this, and frankly, you know, times change. Certain professions just, you, you can't work at them anymore. And occasionally, economic hard times do come around. I think the, the, the problem we're looking at here, Toby, was caused a lot by government policies. But frankly, you're not guaranteed a job 100% of the time. I don't know where people got this idea that there will never, ever be people who want a job who don't have it. That's just not the real world. Well, personally, Nick, I like the idea of smashing the machines. I think that's the best idea this Instead show has ever come up people? with. Instead of going after people? Well, I, it's better to smash a machine than a person, as far as I'm concerned. Let's, if we're going to have a scapegoat, let's make it robots instead of brown people. It just seems like a nicer thing to do. We're all humans, after all, right? Can't we gang up on the machines? Yes? I don't know. I guess there's no good answer to this. But anyway, speaking of... No good answers. There is one answer I do like, and that's referring back to the Constitution when we get confused about what policies to enact with our big government. What should we go to next? Uh, one idea I do like is referring back to that old tattered document that was created by some, some men many, many years ago who, who had an idea about a country. The Constitution. And I like the idea of referring back to that when you have troubles about, well, what should you do in certain situations and Fourth Amendment prospects and what have you? And um, that's, that's what I would like to get into next in just a minute when my camera switches over because um, Nick has the next story to us about a Fourth Amendment issue that's coming out of California where the, the courts over there have essentially ruled that, well, the Constitution doesn't matter, right, Nick? And, Basically, uh, well... Screw it. Throw it out the window. What they're doing is they're, they're greatly extending uh, what police officers are allowed to do, what's considered a reasonable search. Um, and I'll give a little bit of the backstory. I, don't, I guess you need enough of the details of the case to understand uh, where the Fourth Amendment objection comes in here. Um, the California Court of Appeals ruled on September 26 that a police officer is rifling through a, a, a cell phone belonging to someone who, he, who had just been pulled over for a traffic violation uh, was appropriate. They, they're upholding it. Uh, Reed Natoli was pulled over uh, in December 6, 2009. Um, and it's, uh, supposedly he was taking a female friend home. Uh, he was allegedly speeding on Highway 1. Uh, after speaking with Nolte on the side of the road, Officer Ryan, the police officer in this case, suspected the 25-year-old was under the influence of a stimulant drug. The story's not um, more specific than that. I don't know if the allegation was more specific than that, uh, but based on his behavior, he thought he was on a stimulant drug. My guess would be cocaine or methamphetamine. Those are the two that you would you typically run into. Um, Natoli asked if his car uh, could stay on the side of the road because he he was being arrested and his, Officer Ryan said the vehicle would be impounded. Um, Officer Ryan refused to do that and said that uh, he needed to conduct an inventory search prior to towing. Now, at no point here does it say that Natoli gave consent to a search. So basically the officer said, no, we're impounding the car. He was arresting him. So under, under court rulings, and there's a fair amount of case law that says 
if a police officer, um, you know, if, if there's probable cause, and depending on his behavior, it might meet the threshold for probable cause to suspect that there was a crime. So if there was probable cause to think that Natoli was operating the vehicle while impaired or um, was under the influence of an illicit substance, then the police officer can search the car. That's fairly well supported by case law. And basically the idea here being, my understanding of it is that the police officer can look anywhere where they suspect um, drugs might be in that case or whatever the crime is. They can search anywhere it's reasonable to believe that the, uh, the contraband or the evidence might be. Now what comes in in this case is that Officer Ryan found a legal Gwa uh, Glock 20 pistol in the, in the trunk of the vehicle. Um, and it was legally owned, legally, from the sounds of it, legally stored. But he also noticed Natoli's cell phone in this case, which had a picture of somebody, a masked man, holding two AR-15 rifles. So based on that picture, which wasn't necessarily the defendant and wasn't necessarily taken in the state of California, um, even though it's possible that those that activity was legal in California with the proper licenses. Um, there was no evidence to believe that that was necessarily evidence of a crime for any particular reason. It's possible that it's evidence of a crime. Um, it's possible that it includes a defendant, but there, there was no hard connection there. So he actually searched the cell phone and using evidence found inside the cell phone, uh, Found, they did eventually go to Natoli's house, found a large cache of weapons, a marijuana growing operation, and $15,000 in cash. So, yes, he was a drug dealer, a heavily armed drug dealer. Not a great guy. Frankly, yeah, he's guilty of committing a lot of crimes here. The issue comes in is, is was there a probable cause to search the cell phone? Because once that ruling is made, then it applies not only to people who are guilty of a whole bunch of crimes, but to anybody who's got a cell phone in a vehicle. And if you say that, yes, you committed a crime, well, wh where does that, uh, where's the line where you say, well, somebody committed a crime, and so I get to search through their cell phone and go fishing for anything else that they might have done that's illegal. Well, Nick, so if you don't have anything to hide, why do you care? I think, I think just about, number one, just about everybody has something to hide, frankly. I, what are you I, hiding, I don't, Nick? I don't really buy that... Uh, that other people don't really have, <laughs> don't really have anything to hide. Frankly, there's so many laws on the books. There's no way you could possibly know whether you have something to hide or not. You have you read all the laws? Yeah, but no, most people don't have marijuana grow operations and uh, illegal no, that, rifles stored at their house. So I mean, they're true. they're hiding sm small petty stuff. Um, I, I don't think that. The, how does this apply to the average person? Uh, I think that I think I think most people are actually guilty of a crime at any given time. I think that if police actually went through most of the houses, say in this community, most of them could be put away. Now I think that's due to overcriminalization. I think that's due to a lot of bad laws on the books. And I also think that just a search by itself is a violation of privacy. Plus, Fourth Amendment issues. If you have the ability to search something, the police pretty much have the ability to seize it. So if they don't actually need cause to search you or seize you, then they can just stop you over and over and over again and essentially harass you with the searches and the seizures of your property. It's a pain in the butt to lose your cell phone. They could just take it from you. Well, see, uh, you know, uh, uh, potentially right. and I think another to you and things like that. Another important point here is the Constitution's there for a reason. The Bill of Rights is there for a reason. If you don't have these protections in place, well, what do you really have? What's the point in having the Constitution if you're just going to say, oh, we don't like the, the Fourth Amendment, throw that out? Yeah, it's, it's made to protect people, and it does protect a lot of bad people too. But that's kind of the price you pay for freedom and living in a society that's supposed to be free. I mean, if people don't have anything to hide, well, why not let police come in and randomly search their houses? Or why not just put up random uh, street stops all over the place and have uh, police randomly searching cars all, all over? Why not take it a step further and put up cameras in uh, right outside your house or maybe even in your home? You know, in parts of the UK, they're actually doing that, putting privates in the homes of private residences, of uh, those people who are sketchy folk.
I think we read an article saying there's some 20,000 of them or so um, who are poor parents who are getting closed circuit television cameras put in their homes. Why not do that here in the United States? You know, it is a slippery slope to be going down, but the Fourth Amendment's there for a reason. I mean, it's written down. I, and w if you're, as, as you mentioned, Nick, it's all having to do with case law. Yeah, this is a sketchy fellow, probably a very bad man, it sounds like. I don't know anything besides what you just told us, Nick. Sounds like a, a sketchy fellow. But what about everybody else? I right. mean, that, well, this is case thing. law that now applies that's to everyone. Thing. I mean, you're pulled over, they right. can search oh, your yeah, cell phone. Apply, you're applying one standard to everyone, whether it's the Fourth Amendment applies or it doesn't apply. And frankly, even given the fact that the Fourth Amendment does, in the fact that it does give people protections, you know, there's a process that the police have to go through. Basically, they have to show good evidence before they search you, which I don't know why they would want to search you if they didn't have good evidence. It seems like they should be doing something That's what else. fishing is. Right, but, you know, it's basically because they know that there are a lot of people breaking laws because, you know, because of the war on drugs, because of a lot of laws, a lot of victimless crimes out there that they can go fishing for. But frankly, even given all the, the protections, and that's a criticism that some people have of the Fourth Amendment, is that it protects bad people. Well, frankly, I like living in the United States better than a country where you don't have a constitution, you don't have due process rights, you, police can just search you anytime, any place, because they feel like it. Those countries are usually awful places to live. Those are countries where their people are usually abused by their governments pretty severely. Um, and that's most of the world, frankly. So I'm, for one, I'm glad to live in a country where even though it's, it's been under increasing assault, there is still a, a, a constitution and there is still a Fourth Amendment and there are still some due process rights. Some semblance left anyways. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you're certainly better, well, I still think you're certainly better off than sure. you would be in, um, say, China or Russia or India or most parts of the world. Fair so. enough. Well, it's eroded. We're a Personal, little bit more like yeah. that every single day. Eroded just a wee bit more each day. Anyways, we did plug it, so we've got to talk about it. Just wanted to mention it quickly because it is big out there. I know you've talked a little bit on the radio show about it, Nick. Uh, but, you know, the, the Occupy Wall Street protests. Um, I just want to mention this story briefly because these, these protests are starting to pop up all over the United States. And, well, some cities and localities are handling them better than others. Um, some places are cracking down and some places aren't. Two dozen arrested after protest in uh, state capital. More than two dozen people were arrested Sunday after an Occupy Iowa protest at the state capital. The group came together to re replicate the protests in Washington as well as New York and many other places. Um, about 400 people gathered and uh, after about 11 o'clock at night, the state police showed up and they gave two warnings. They told the crowd to disperse. When they didn't, they arrested 20 people until the crowd dispersed. So I guess they just started arresting people until people decided they didn't want to get arrested and went home. So, Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly think you're going to see more of these protests. Because a lot of people are dis disenfranchised. They're almost angry. up to 1,000 of them now. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm still trying to figure out what to make of the whole Occupy Wall Street thing because um, in as much as we and we talk about here on on the TV show and the radio show that yeah I mean I think there are a lot of legitimate points. Frankly, I think that government does do a lot to hurt ninety nine percent of the people to benefit a very select few. I think that's the way it actually works. I don't know what the solutions are here, and I think that it's a pretty disparate group. I think that there are you know people participating in these protests have varying opinions. So I can agree with them if they want. If they want the government to stop giving special protections and special privileges to corporations, bailing out large financial institutions at the expense of working class people, that's certainly an area of agreement. Frankly, Toby, there's a lot of areas where things that the Tea Party is upset about and things that Occupy Wall Street are upset about, are they overlap to an extent. Some of the talking points are the same, uh, so I, I, I'm just going to be interested to see how this all plays out, though, because I, I think much in the way that the Tea Party took on a partisan tone and largely, I think, got co-opted by mainstream Republicans, by the institutions that they were meant to challenge, I think that the same thing's probably going to happen from the Democratic Party with Occupy Wall Street. I hope that it doesn't happen. It would be nice if, if people would come together and drop the, the artificial partisan divides 
and stop fighting with each other and maybe actually change some things. But you know, we saw what happened with the Tea Party. We, mm -hmm. we, we had largely the same yeah. discussion. We don't know what to make of it. It'll probably get co-opted. Oh, look, pretty much did. Yeah, so we won't have Republicans and Democrats anymore. We'll just have Tea Partiers and Occupy Wall Streeters. Hmm. Right. Well, I, I, know, I, think, I, think the, I think the intentions of a lot of the people taking part in both of On those On the grassroots level. Right, the ways. grassroots people, people are upset. They're legitimately upset. They feel disenfranchised. Um, but if they just get sucked back into the same old debate and that's yeah, basically as stand-ins for the Republican and the Democratic Party, nothing's going to change. All right. Well, we don't have much time for it, Nick, and luckily, I guess it's the my kind of story not to have much time for <laughs> because it's that gloss over the eyes subject of fiscal irresponsibility. Right. Well, and the United States certainly doesn't have a monopoly on it, actually, uh, you know, all things considered for a country that has run up a massive deficit and is slowly destroying its currency, slowly is a key word there, they've done a better job of not bankrupting the country or defaulting than most other countries in the world. Not saying the United States is doing a good job, not saying the US dollar is going to get stronger in the long run, not saying any of that, just saying that they did a less bad job of it for most of the century, last century than most of the other countries in the world. So let's not pretend it's a uniquely American problem. Um, and one place that's facing similar challenges is China. Um, they have a credit bubble of their own. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the Chinese economy being overheated. Basically, the central banks making money too cheap and excess reliance on credit, really way too much leverage. A lot of the same things we saw here in the US, a credit bubble. China is still nominally communist, but their economy is functioning a lot more like a free market society in some ways than economies in the West. And they run into the same issues where, you know, excessive credit, excessive leverage, uh, you know, causes a bubble and then the bubble bursts. And the Chinese central bank is dealing with this differently than we have here in the U.S. and in many parts of the world. They're actually tightening up on monetary policy, which means uh, they're making the money less cheap or less easy to borrow. They're raising interest rates. Um, so what you're going to see is less availability of credit in China. There's some concern that you're going to see a recession in China or at least a slowing. Uh, and the, the issue here is, Toby, that if they were to have a deep enough recession in China or enough of a slowing, or enough instability with their monetary system, they might not be able to loan the U.S. government money anymore. Oh, what will we do we'll after been balance our budget? A big part of bankrolling this massive deficit. How will we have a giant done. government here if we can't borrow money from China? We could just print it. Oh, well, that's good. Phew. That's fun. We that's can still fun. have that's a big government. Right? All right, well, we're out of time it's this not. week. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I hope we angered some of you out there. Until next week, it's been Toby here with you. And that's freemindstv.com. In the meantime, have a great night.